the social conference address. God created the native, God created the European, but somebody else created the mixed breed, we heard a horribly blasphemous Englishman say. Before us lies the inaugural address of Mr. Justice Ranade, voicing the reformatory zeal of the Indian Social Conference. In it, there is a huge array of instances of intercaste marriages of yore, a good deal about the liberal spirit of the ancient Kshatriyas, good sober advice to students, all expressed with an earnestness of goodwill and gentleness of language that is truly admirable. The last part, however, which offers advice as to the creation of a body of teachers for the new movement strong in the Punjab, which we take for granted, is the Arya Samaj, founded by a sannyasin, leaves us wondering and asking ourselves the question. It seems God created the Brahmin, God created the Kshatriya, but who created the sannyasin? There have been and are sannyasins or monks in every known religion. There are Hindu monks, Buddhist monks, Christian monks, and even Islam had to yield its rigorous denial and take in whole orders of mendicant monks. There are the wholly shaved, the partly shaved, the long hair, short hair, matted hair, and various other hirsute types. There are the sky-clad, the rag-clad, the ochre-clad, the yellow-clad monks, the black-clad Christian, and the blue-clad Muslim. Then there have been those that tortured their flesh in various ways, and others who believed in keeping their bodies well and healthy. There was also, in odd days, in every country, the monk militant. The same spirit and similar manifestations haste run in parallel lines with the women too. The nuns. Mr. Ranade is not only the president of the Indian Social Conference, but a chivalrous gentleman also. The nuns of the Shrutis and Smritis seem to have been to his entire satisfaction. The ancient celibate Brahmavadins, who travelled from court to court challenging great philosophers, do not seem to him to thwart the central plan of the Creator, the propagation of species. Nor did they seem to have lacked in the variety and completeness of human experience. In Mr. Ranade's opinion, as the stronger sex following the same line of conduct seem to have done. We therefore dismiss the ancient nuns and their modern spiritual descendants as having passed muster. The arch offender, man alone has to bear the brunt of Mr. Ranade's criticism. Let us see whether he survives it or not. It seems to be the consensus of opinion among savants that this worldwide monastic institution had its first inception in this curious land of ours, which appears to stand so much in need of social reform. The married teacher and the celibate are both as old as the Vedas. Whether the Soma-sipping married Rishi with his all-rounded experience was the first in order of appearance, or the lack human experience celibate Rishi was the primeval form, is hard to decide just now. Possibly Mr. Ranade will solve the problem for us independently of the hearsay of the so-called Western Sanskrit scholars. Till then, the question stands a riddle like the hen and egg problem of yore. But whatever be the order of Genesis, the celibate teachers of the Shrutis and Smritis stand on an entirely different platform from the married ones, which is perfect chastity, Brahmacharya. If the performance of Yajnas is the cornerstone of the work portion of the Vedas, as surely is Brahmacharya the foundation of the knowledge portion. Why could not the bloodshedding sacrificers be the exponents of the Upanishads? Why? On the one side was the married Rishi, with his meaningless, bizarre, nay, terrible ceremonials, his misty sense of ethics, to say the least. On the other hand, the celibate monks tapping, in spite of their want of human experience, springs of spirituality and ethics, at which the monastic jinas, the Buddhas, down to Shankara, Ramanuja, Kabir and Chaitanya, drank deep and acquired energy to propagate their marvellous spiritual and social reforms, and which, reflected third-hand, fourth-hand from the West, is giving our social reformers the power even to criticize the sannyasins. At the present day, what support, what pay do the mendicants receive in India compared to the pay and privilege of our social reformers? And what work does the social reformer do compared to the sannyasins' silent, selfless labor of love? But they have not learned the modern method of self-advertisement. The Hindu drank in with his mother's milk that this life is as nothing, a dream.
In this, he is at one with the Westerners, but the Westerner sees no further and his conclusion is that of the Charvaka, to make hay while the sun shines. This world being a miserable whole, let us enjoy to the utmost what morsels of pleasure are left to us. To the Hindu, on the other hand, God and soul are the only realities, infinitely more real than this world, and he is therefore ever ready to let this go for the other. So long as this attitude of the national mind continues, and we pray it will continue forever, what hope is there in our anglicized compatriots to check the impulse in Indian men and women to renounce all for the good of the universe and for one's own freedom? And that rotten corpse of an argument against the monk, used first by the Protestants in Europe, borrowed by the Bengali reformers, and now embraced by our Bombay brethren, the monk on account of his celibacy must lack the realization of life in all its fullness and in all its varied experience. We hope this time the corpse will go for good into the Arabian Sea, especially in these days of plague, and notwithstanding the filial love one may suppose the foremost clan of Brahmins there may have for ancestors of great perfume, if the Pauranika accounts are of any value in tracing their ancestry. By the by, in Europe, between the monks and nuns, they have brought up and educated most of the children, whose parents, though married people, were utterly unwilling to taste of the varied experiences of life. Then, of course, every faculty has been given to us by God for some use. Therefore, the monk is wrong in not propagating the race, a sinner. Well, so also have been given us the faculties of anger, lust, cruelty, theft, robbery, cheating, etc., every one of these being absolutely necessary for the maintenance of social life, reformed or unreformed. What about these? Ought they also to be maintained at full steam, following the varied experience theory or not? Of course, the social reformers, being in intimate acquaintance with God Almighty and His purposes, must answer the query in the positive. Are we to follow Vishwamitra, Atri, and others in their ferocity, and the Vashishta family in particular, in their full and varied experience with womankind? For the majority of married rishis are as celebrated for their liberality in begetting children wherever and whenever they could, as for their hymn-singing and soma-bibbing, or are we to follow the celibate rishis who upheld brahmacharya as the sine qua non of spirituality? Then there are the usual backsliders, who ought to come in for a load of abuse, monks who could not keep up to their ideal, weak, wicked. But if the ideal is straight and sound, a backsliding monk is head and shoulders above any householder in the land, on the principle, it is better to have loved and lost. Compared to the coward that never made the attempt, he is a hero. If the searchlight of scrutiny were turned on the inner workings of our social reform conclave, angels would have to take note of the percentage of backsliders as between the monk and the householder, and the recording angel is in our own heart. But then, what about this marvellous experience of standing alone, discarding all help, breasting the storms of life, of working without any sense of recompense, without any sense of putrid duty, working a whole life, joyful, free, not goaded on to work like slaves by false human love or ambition? This the monk alone can have. What about religion? Has it to remain or vanish? If it remains, it requires its experts, its soldiers. The monk is the religious expert, having made religion his one matter of life. He is the soldier of God. What religion dies so long as it has a band of devoted monks? Why are Protestant England and America shaking before the onrush of the Catholic monk? Why Vranade and the social reformers? But, O oh India, anglicized India, do not forget, child, that there are in this society problems that neither you nor your Western guru can yet grasp the meaning of, much less solve.